Hello, everyone. Welcome to the British Library South Asia seminar series, which is part of our research and digitization called Two Centuries of Indian Print. Uh, we are very excited today to have uh, Professor Ananya Jahanara Kabir and Ari Bottier as our speakers. Um, Ananya is a professor of English literature at King's College London and the author of Territory of Desire, representing the value of Kashmir, which was published in 2009, and Partitions Post Amnesia, 1947-1971, and Modern South Asia, which was published in 2013. Her new research project is Creole Indias. Ari Gautier is a franco tamil author of historical fiction, currently resident in Oslo, whose novels are Karnat's Secret, The Lakshmi, published in 2015, and Latinai, published in 2017. And he has recently uh, uh, published his third novel called uh, Nocturne Pondicherry. In May 2020, Ananya and Ari co-founded the cultural platform Latinai Creole to promote their vision of multicultural, plural, and creolized India. We are also very happy to have uh, Dr. Lisa, Liza Oliver uh, as a chair for this event. Liza is an associate professor of art at Wellesley College. Uh, she's an art historian focusing on 18th and 19th century Europe and South Asia, colonialism, Indian Ocean Trade and Intersections of Art and Science. She's also the author of Art, Trade and Imperialism in Early Modern French India, published in 2019. So Ananya and Ari are going to speak to us today about Vine on Trellis, Pondicherry's Creolizing Culture. Uh, let me uh, brief you on the format of the event. The Ananya and Ari are going to speak to us for about 45 minutes, after which there'll be a brief discussion uh, between them and uh, Liza, after which we'll open it up for audience questions. However, while the talk is on or during the discussion, you would like to put in your questions, please use the Q&A box or the chat box to do so. And I'll take them in order uh, when we have our Q&A session. So without much further ado, I invite Ananya and Ari to speak to us today about Vine on Trellis, Pondicherry's Creolizing Culture. Over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Priyanka. It's really nice to be presenting for an institution we love and cherish and need so much, the British Library. Um, thank you to Liza for agreeing to chair and respond to us. And of course, thank you to my collaborator, Ari Gautier, for being here with me, even though he's officially on holiday in Norway. So <laughs> that's very, it's very good of you to give us uh, the time, despite you actually being off. Um, now, uh, we have uh, used uh, the title, um, Vine on trellis, because we wanted to refer directly to the lovely image of the uh, from the British Library's archives, uh, which graces the flyer of this event. And um, the, the image is indeed of vines growing on a trellis, and it's uh, a colored etching by an anonymous artist of a trellis arcade which supports a vine in the governor's garden at Pondicherry. And it was probably published in India in the late 18th century. Uh, the artist is unknown. Um, and um, this, this uh, image obviously takes us um, to a certain kind of interaction of a very European perspective. Uh, we'll, we'll go to the image in a second. I'll start the PowerPoint in a second. Um, you know, this very, um, it's perspectival, it's very orderly, it's very enlightenment, in fact, you know. And then you've got this uh, organic and unpredictable forms of the vine all over the trellis. Naturally, this was about viticulture. It was about uh, the French trying to introduce um, uh, vines um, in order to produce wine <laughs> in Pondicherry. And um, there is archival evidence of such people. For example, uh, there was in uh, 1754, so after the time of uh, our, our image, um, it's, it's provenance, it's, it's dating, well after, around or after that, uh, Pierre Lalouette de Vernicourt, who was born in 1754 in Paris, made his way um, to uh, Pondicherry. Um, and by um, 1789, he was serving in about uh, in the first of three campaigns in India under Suffren. And, uh, you know, he, he did all, you know, he did stuff in Pondicherry. Uh, 
you know, as 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 part of the of of the military, but he then also, you know, became quite an expert in viticulture, and then through series of chopping and changing allegiances, landed up in Australia, where he was called upon uh, the governor of New South Wales to give, um, you know, some kind of um, uh, expertise in. How producing vines in tropical lands. So Ari, you know a little bit about the governor's garden, don't you, where this trellis is from? Do you want to tell us about that? What happened yeah. to vines? Yeah, now in the governor garden, or first of all, the governor palace um, was built around the 18th century, I think it's uh, 1738 uh, okay. by uh, a study with a guy called Jabo, and they, ended up building in 1752 uh, by Sony, all this under duplex. And mm -hmm. of course, you can, if you see the picture, you can see the, uh, what do you call the-, the, the Maybe the, I should start showing the picture. Yeah, yeah, that would be nice. Do, do, do-, do uh, Yeah, I'll, I'll keep on, you know, you, you, yeah. you do that. So you can see the governor palace in the back. So the, the Van de Trey, it's in the front where actually the I.E. Mandabam, if people know Pondicherry, know that where the I.E. Mandabam uh, built by Napoleon III is there. So that is where the Van de Trey was, uh, w w w yeah, you can see. Can people see it? Yeah. Yeah? Right. So you can see that on the back is the governor palace. So it, it must be, it must be as, as, as far as I can see, where the I.E. Mandabam is there now. And, um, as you know, architecture was also used as, as a tool uh, of the splendor of the colonial empire, because architecture, that's what architecture does. It's not just for the sake of building something, but it's also a way of showing power. So in that way, uh, the Van de Trie, I think, it's not I think, it, they, they started to produce, trying to produce wine, because it was too expensive for them to bring wine all the way down from, from France, and which they did uh, for two, three shipments, I think one of the shipments just went down in the sea. So <laughs> they, they never saw that bottles. And so they dis, they decided to have vin de très vin, viniculture, viticulture, pardon, in, in India. And they did also in Pondicherry, in Surat, and other places, but they never managed to do that for some reason or the other because either the lack of the technique or maybe the soil was not correct or simply, yeah, they, they didn't masterize the, the way of doing this. So that's one of the reasons that uh, we never saw any uh, French wine in, in Pondicherry. We never saw any French wine perhaps, but we do now uh, many, many, you know, in the post-colonial period, of course, India is producing some kind of wine, but from the historical period, yes. Um, when, when, the, the, the vines didn't ultimately yield wine, uh, but this very powerful image of order, you know, trying to impose order remains for us. This etching remains because, of course, in due course, we won't go into all those details now, but the governor's uh, palace and garden also does not remain anymore. So, but the image remains. And I think this brings us uh, into the heart of what we want to talk about. Material culture, not just as what stands and what is tangible, but also how it goes into orders of representation. Um, and uh, here, I think I want to move to um, um, uh, someone who, of course, has also spoken um, at the British Library South Asia seminar series, um, Professor Supriya Chaudhary uh, from um, Emerita of Jadhapur University, who has written um, quite uh, quite a lot on uh, material culture in 19th century India, focusing on Bengal, um, and. I want to just say a few, um, a quote something from um, one of her splendid essays on furniture in 19th century Bengal uh, to kind of clarify to people where Ari and I are going with our interest in um, not just creolizing culture of Pondicherry, but in this talk specifically focusing on material culture that's creolized and creolizing. So to, to go to Supriya Chaudhary to quote her, this world of objects, she says, think, talking about furniture in general, domestic uh, interiors, this world of objects const constitutes itself as a habitat, to use Barthes' term, within which, quote, men inscribe themselves upon space, unquote, at the same time as it is the characteristic site of what Pierre Bourdieu, following Erin Panofsky, would describe as a habitus. 
for these objects are never the neutral app apparatus. This is what you were saying, Ari, it's about power. They're never the neutral apparatus of a physical world that we unavoidably inhabit. They are the instruments by which a particular way of life is articulated and reproduced in the specific form that the description of domestic interiors, particularly of furniture, takes in the European novel of the 19th century, it most commonly figures the habitus of conspicuous consumption expressed as wealth or taste, unquote. So Supriya Chaudhary, uh, Professor Chaudhary here is talking about 19th century European novels, realist novels that take great pains at describing domestic interiors. And then um, she, um, you know, goes on to observe that despite this enormous signifying value, particularly of furniture, because both of its use value and its display value. Um, even though you can see the significance of, of, of this kind of um, material culture, um, she says that um, the history of furniture has appeared to be no more than a minor episode in the larger history of the applied arts, unquote. And uh, what she then goes uh, on to do in this particular essay is to show through a range of 19th century Bengali novelists, such as Bankim Chandra and so on, how all these kinds of European furniture enter and transform the Bengali habitus. And what she then comments on, and that's really another important point I want to make here. She says, however, using the uh, example of someone like Bonkim, she says, it's not as an art historian or as a sociologist that I approach furniture and it's the study of its significance. It's as someone interested in literary representation. So that's pretty much where we are also, Ari and I. Um, it's in this mode that we approach material culture, in this case of Pondicherry, as creolizing culture. He as a writer of literature and I as a, a critic of literature. Now at this point, we'll switch uh, tack and um, start um, asking Ari a little bit about his own writing. Um, in your novel, um, Lotinai, um, which came out in 2017, um, you, you, it's a very descriptive novel. You're describing as much as narrating. And one of the things that you spend a lot of time on uh, describing is the house of a Chetiar, a Chetiar merchant. Um, and there's, and, the, and, and all, the, all the things inside this house, all the different items of furniture, all the embellishments. Do you want to tell us a little bit about this, about this house, Ari, and about the furniture in this house? Why, why was it important to you? Yeah, you know, as you were talking about uh, Supriya Chaudhary's essay and most of the uh, writers you mentioned, they are Bengalis. Yeah. Right, but in, for example, in Pondicherry, that was not the case. As I always say, for 350 years, there were very few Tamil writers who wrote about ourselves or about the Pondicherry colonial period. So most of them was, were uh, French, European uh, writers who wrote about Pondicherry. So most of the novels, they don't depict uh, this material culture, or even if they depict, they depict only from the colonial houses, but not from the Indian houses. And those only one person's house takes a lot of focus is Anandaranga Pillai with the Dubash. Yeah. Uh, to duplex. But it seems that the Chetiar were the merchants, the, the traders who were part of uh, commodities movement, they were totally ignored. Mm -hmm. And as you know, I used to live in the Chetiar house, uh, Chetiar Street, sorry, Ishwan Coil Street, and opposite my house was the famous Kalati Chetiar. Could you, could you please show that picture? Yeah. So that, uh, our public know. Okay, this is Kalati Chetiar. So Kalati Chetiar comes from a very wealthy Natukote Chetiar from Karikudi between Sivaganga and Madurai, and his family were part of already even, even before uh, the, the Chetiar were already uh, traders, even before the arrival of Europeans through, through uh, I mean, during the Chola, Chola Empire. It's not, they are just only starting to trade uh, after the colonial, uh, colonial uh, the European arrived, but they were doing different type of trade, you see? And once the European came, they, they did the change their, uh, their trading system to something different, which, which suit the, the, the European uh, 
the the the, 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 the Europeans. So Kalati Chetar used to live. Uh, I used to live in front of his house, and my universe at the age of twelve was this. So you could see the amount of chandeliers and bureaus and everything. These are not Indian furnitures. You see, these are furnitures was brought from different part of different part of the world. And uh, so when I wanted to write about the house we used to live in the, in the novel, so it was normal that I got inspired by Karati Chetia's house to write, to fictionalize because that Louis Kain's bureau doesn't exist. One so, minute, we, are, we haven't yet got to the bureau. We need no, no, to okay, but I'm, with the furniture we are talking, it's about the bureau I'm writing, which I spent almost, as you know, more than three months to do research, just to write like one paragraph. Of, of the thing. So that's why for me, it was important not only to put that new element in the uh, history of literature of Pondicherry, that the Chetiar also are part of a, a very important role in, in terms of uh, culture, uh, culture, uh, material culture. And then the second one is also to, to note that Indian taste was also uh, also evolved with the arrival, not evolved, but change, like you say, with the arrival of the European. So they, it's a kind of, that's what exactly what we are gonna talk, how the creolization process, which is happening. So how this- Can I just stop you there? Because please. I want to go to the Bureau. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You are going ahead of my, of, of my, of my sequence. Um, can, can I, I would like to just point out- but, you know, I mean, First of all, let me ask you first, you asked me something. Let me ask you, why you, when you read my book, you immediately stopped me and you called me and you said, this is fascinating. But why is it you got fascinated by that passage? Yeah, there was a passage there. We are talking, everybody should know that we are talking not just about the uh, passage uh, which starts chapter three of your book where you talk about this entire house, yeah. the house that you fictionalize, but which is draws very uh, obviously very closely on this particular real home and the things in it. But it also zooms in onto a, one piece of furniture, which is this uh, bureau, you know, and um, I call it the Chetia's bureau. And I was really fascinated by this, by this item of furniture. And that is because um, as we can see, there's a, you, you, you have spent a lot of time and effort as an author describing this bureau. So I have analyzed the different elements in this passage, which I've put on this PowerPoint here that people can have a look. The first line is your French, and then the second line in bold, people can hopefully read uh, the quotes, is about, uh, I mean, is my translation. So Ari, I mean, I'm really, I was fascinated by the fact that this bureau was firstly, um, it was exceptional, you know, um, it was amazing. Uh, as an author, you spend a lot of time telling us why it's amazing. So firstly, its form and its function. This piece of furniture is something which is called a secretaire, uh, in French and a bureau in English. And it's um, a copy of a Louis Kant's bureau. So it's very, it's kind of very ornate and very, very uh, expensive and very, very, it tells you something in just its form and its function. And the second thing which is interesting is that the Chetiar wanted it replicated, you know, mm. Mm. And um, you created this Chetiar um, having this, uh, you know, wishes fulfilled through some master carpenter who's local. From, from the Telugu. From Telugu. the Telugu. So he's not coming from France. I mean, like he's basically yeah. indigenous, if you like. I mean, you know, he's from the, he's from that part of, of the, in fact, he's from the coast, that co the Coromandel coast. And then he, um, he copies this. He, he does it to, you know, he does something which is perhaps even better uh, then the original because the materials and that's the third point which is on the PowerPoint that there were, you spend a lot of time giving us this exotic list of woods you know um, which sounds even better in French perhaps uh, <laughs> rosewood sycamore nourished pear cherry urofoya some of them aren't even in English words so zebrano burmese satin ebony and the Ceylonese lemon tree so all these different woods are inlaid but because of that technique also, there is something very specific. The uh, Telugu carpenter had skills 
you know, that he could fit all these different woods together. And then he kind of burnished it with the special technique, uh, which put gold on the bronze and using stone. So it was, it's, there's a lot going on. <laughs> and I was extremely curious about, about the ex extraordinary amount of effort you put into describing to us the way this bureau came together. Because um, it's not really like we never encounter it again in the novel. It doesn't play a very important role in the protagonist. You know what I mean? It doesn't push the plot. It doesn't have any role at all. <laughs> it doesn't have any role. So, but you still spend the two ages, ages, and and you know, gave it so much prominence. So this is what I found fascinating as a literary critic. And this is really what Supriya Chaudhary says that this is what it means to be a, a a reader of literature and a critic of literature um, to, to ask what is the job this furniture, this piece of furniture is doing. So for me, I think you're invested in it because there's something that you appreciate about this part of your growing up in Pondicherry that you were exposed you know, to this sort of a thing. And I think this is what makes us agree that Pondicherry is, um, is a rather unusual place. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we have called it, in a sense, we agree that it's what we call a creolizing contact zone. And that brings us to the heart of our topic. I mean, we already started referring to some of these things, Ari. Shall we, shall we see some maps and we can talk a little bit about what makes Pondicherry a creolizing contact zone? Um, unless you want to tell us a little bit more about the Chetia's Bureau at this stage. No, the Chetia Bureau, the number, you, you rightly, um jot it down in forms and function, makers and brokers, material and technique. But what is very interesting is exactly, not only I wanted to talk about the, the, the different materials, it's also the technique, because which is, uh, as I said, uh, Jean-Henri uh, Reisner, yeah. uh, très grand, was a sorry, very, very big ebonist in the court of uh, Jean-Louis XV. Yeah. And how come that Jean-Henri Reisner techniques that the Tungu uh, carpenter can copy it. So how we import also technique is not only the material we import, not only the style, it's also the technique. But then again, when it comes to the Tungu carpenter, he modified it to make it even better. So this is what I'm interested. Yeah, yeah, no, you're absolutely right. It's it's that mysterious give and take, right? Nothing, I mean, when, when knowledge, firstly, there is something uh, quite mysterious about knowledge passing in an embodied way, you know, um, in the beginning and different European powers uh, coming to places on the African continent, for example, as well as, uh, you know, Asia. So uh, I've done some work on Elmina, you know, the castle of Elmina on the west coast of Ghana, and the Portuguese actually brought with them in their ships uh, masonry as well as masons to build Elmina, because they had no idea what they would find in Ghana. You know, they had no clue who, what, I mean, they, they just assumed the worst and they got their stuff. But obviously, as time went on, this it was understood that there are local craftsmen, there are local materials. Absolutely. So there's a give and take of technology, of knowledge, and then something happens, you know, that is what we are interested in. And uh, uh, we call creolization following, of course, a lot of theorists of creolization. But what we do is, Ari, I think you'll agree that our, our, um, our extension of this idea of creolization is really uh, facilitated by the position of Monticherry. And yeah. we see some maps yeah. here. Yeah. Um, Pondicherry, which is not an island, which is the usual locus and focus of creolization theories, the assumption is that creolization is something that usually happens on an island. And we are um, very interested in saying, well, why ever not on an island-like space, which is not just Pondicherry, but all the different um, uh, stations, if you like, settlements or enclaves of French India, which if you zoom in and you see fractally become ever more fragmented and enclave, like the enclave is composed of mini enclaves, you know. Uh, these are maps from, of course, the excellent uh, book by Jessica Namakal, Unsettling Utopia, which has very recently come out. So Ari, um, how do you feel this coastal um, situation 
of uh, Pondicherry. Uh, what was its contribution or how did it stimulate the process we are calling creolization? How do we get from the coast to- I mean, uh, you, you, know, you know, it's not very well, but even though it's um, contested, there are some historians who are contesting that the fact that Arike Medu, which was a Roman um, settlement, mm -hmm. because there was a trade were happening already with the Roman Empire uh, very long back. Uh, there are some people con contesting, but since I know, I, I'm from the area, I, I, I visited many times Arike Medu, and even my ancestors, they are telling stories. So uh, the, it has been a contact zone for centuries. It's nothing happened in 1673 when the French entered the, uh, entered the space. So before that, there was, as I said, we were Romans. And then the Portuguese came because Naga Patinam, which is not very far from Pondicherry, was uh, one of the major port for, for the Portuguese. So from Portuguese, the, from Naga Patinam, sorry, they used Pondicherry because Pondicherry was a, uh, what you call very productive textile mm -hmm. industry. Mm -hmm. that's, what, that's why the, the French people got interested in Pondicherry because, because of the textile. So Pondicherry was another, uh, another port, not port city, but a tra transit area uh, where they could uh, collect um, textile to take them uh, uh, further to Southeast Asia and uh, other places. So then the Portuguese came, then the Dutch came, the, Dan the Danes were there for some time. And then finally the French came in 1673 to establish this, uh, this uh, loge, mm -hmm. as they said. Uh, and uh, so the, the, Dan the, the Dutch were the people who really mapped uh, Pondicherry, did the map for Pondicherry. Uh, I don't know if you have, yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah here we go. So the, the uh, plan from uh, that Deloche is saying is a, it's a, it's a Dutch plan. And for a long time, people were thinking it was made by French, which actually Deloche, thank, thanks to Deloche, he, he demystified the entire um, uh, mystery of saying, no, no, it's not French, it's, it's Dutch. So I, I think from uh, from long time, it has been a content zone. It has been, things were already in the modification process, in the creolization process. It's not something new. And uh, I think a lot of historians like Jason and Stephen has already written about the, we're not today we're not talking about textile, but textile also had the creolization process in Pondicherry. But we're not talking about textile. We're, no, talking we, about. we're not talking too much about textiles today because we can't talk about everything mm -hmm. and we would love to, yeah. though textiles, we are very interested in textiles. Uh, and then again, here also the 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 the, the porcelain, the china yeah. you're you're showing, that yeah. was from the Chinese uh, the, sorry, from the Dutch who imported uh, China from um, from a different part, and they have this atelier de sur décor. I don't know if you can say that in English. Um, it's basically a workshop for overglazing. Oh, overglazing, exactly. So it, that's it, only in 1610. So it means like 60 years before the French established the lodge. So this China was brought to Pondicherry when they had this atelier de sur décor and then send them to send them to Europe. So you can already see how that already it was a contact zone. Well, I mean, I, I think it would be important to uh, clarify exactly what one means by a contact zone. I'm going to do that, if, if I may, because it's of a course. very precise, it's a, I'm using the term in a very precise way. Um, and uh, by contact zone, actually, this is a term that uh, one borrows from uh, Mary Louise Pratt, uh, her very important book, um, quite a classic now called Imperial Eyes, where she... Uh, she offers this, um, this um, uh, concept, uh, I quote her, uh, by contact zone, she says, I use, to ref I use this phrase to refer to the space of imperial encounters, the space in which the peoples geographically and historically separated come into contact with each other and establish ongoing relations, usually involving conditions of coercion, radical inequality and intractable conflict. A contact perspective emphasizes how subjects get constituted in and by their relations to each other. It treats the relations among colonizers and colonized or travelers and travelees, that's her term, not in terms of separateness, but in terms of co-presence, interaction, interlocking, understandings and practices, and often within radically asymmetrical 
relations of power. So I think I, I, I find this um, term contact zone actually really useful to understand um, and map literally what's going on in a place like Pondicherry. It's, it's absolutely right that you say, or you remind us that um, uh, this, this uh, Arikamedu, uh, an, uh, you know, of, um, in the classical period, you know, already there was uh, evidence, there's archaeological evidence of Romans, you know, uh, coming. And of course, in uh, everybody knows that Tamil literature has this idea of Yavanas, you know, the foreigners. Yeah, exactly. this, this, this idea of contact with, with the classical world of the Mediterranean is not at all new or surprising. Um, and as you also pointed out or reminded us earlier, when you started talking about the Chetiars, uh, we have... Uh, the Chetiars trading during the Chola period. You know, again, we don't have to wait for the Europeans for the Chetiars to get active. But I think what happens is um, that when the Europeans arrive one after the other, looking for you know bases, looking to and also in competition with each other, which is why you have the Portuguese uh, hanging around, then the Dutch appear, then the French, then the Dutch overtake, right? There's a period where the Dutch overthrow the French and then they come, the French come back. Am I not right? Yeah, exactly. So, so there is, it's very flu fluid, very volatile. I mean, um, people are accustomed to thinking of Pondicherry. People think, oh yes, there's British India and then there's French India French and of course Pondicherry is French India. But actually French India itself is not really just, just India, uh, the Indians and the French. I mean, there are all these other powers also, you know, jockeying for uh, position and control. And I think the evidence of that is as um, in the material space and site is, is, is as kind of, shall we say, all encompassing as the town plan of Pondicherry itself, which Deloche has conclusively proven mm. is actually of Dutch, uh, you know, uh, the Dutch laid it like that, not the French. And then of course you have what happens in the town, what happens in the circulates um, uh, porcelain, which indeed has to be repackaged in Pondicherry through a workshop that reformulates it and ships it out to, uh, you know, to, to Europe. You use the word transit uh, space and I think uh, that definitely is, it, that's that's idea of places like Pondicherry as hubs or nodes, you know, in a web, yeah. uh, connecting the, the easternmost part of the Indian Ocean all the way to the Black Atlantic. Textiles tells that story very well too. But I think I, I am really more interested in, and, and of course, so are you in the work you do, um, in thinking about uh, what happens when, culture coagulates, you know, and sits in the site. As, um, as this, uh, as Pratt says, um, the space of imperial. We, lit I think history, in the Indian Ocean uh, centric histories have thought a lot about flows and we've learned a lot about flows, but I think that's why we like the work of Liza so much. We must also think about things, about sites, you know, where these things um, took on new shape and new forms. And I think that's why contact zone is important because it, it kind of narrows our perspective down to an actual space where these interactions can happen, which then Pratt talks about. Um, and um, through these interactions, there's like new culture, right? And, and that's also what your book, you, you are interested in, to somehow capture the product of these interactions. Yeah. Whether it's through groups of people or the, the, the things they do, you know. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit about how you, um, what, you um, what you write about in the Thinai about Creole people of Pondicherry? Because in a way, people often ask, is Creolization the same as being Creole? What do you Creole. feel? No, but it's interesting because, you know, uh, I, I like the way that you talk about Arike Medu. Yeah, yeah, Madame Tant, uh, Tant Alice uh, de Rosario. And um, Arike Medu, already when we talk about Arike Medu, Jules Dubreuil, who was the first guy who did uh, uh, research on Arike Medu, who dig the first archaeological site. Uh, he was from West Indies. And he says, Pondicherry, elle est tropicale, elle est créole. So he used the word créole already by Joël Dubreuil, even though, you know, he, he didn't know what he was, but he, he, it's interesting that he, he, he could see the simili similarities between the French in uh, French, French, West Indies, where he comes from, and to the Pondicherry uh, culture, 
where mm -hmm. he lived and he was a professor in a college colonial and then he became uh, he, he was an amateur uh, archaeologist mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. but he, the 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 uh, the camera is um is uh, is uh, what he called is um his research was very very important for the for for Pondicherry because people didn't know Archimedes before Jibo Dubreuil. Okay. So that's very inter interesting to to note that even Jibo Dubreuil says Pondicherry is crayon, and uh, then we again come back to the people as O Creole et Bois Creole that I'm talking in uh, I'm, I'm talking about my book. It was also very important for me to show that Pondicherry was not just the French people and the indigenous people. There were some people in between, which was totally neglected in the history of literature or even uh, in the historical books because Creole, they are not mentioned, but they're mentioned in di different names. They are mentioned as topas. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When they topas, we don't really know if they were Creole, you know? They were like the mixed groups. So that's why it was important for me to had that Creole word into my novel because I understood that there was these people in between, they are very fascinating, they're very interesting. And so the Old Creole, as I explained in my book, they are um, the community of people born only from the French to with Indians, mm -hmm. only French. So the Bas Creole is the other community which people were born from the rest of European, like uh, Portuguese, Danish, uh, Dutch, uh, name, name them, <laughs> you know, uh, Irish, uh, Scottish, mm -hmm. everyone, and with the uh, lo local people. So that is the Bar Creole and O Creole, the difference is there. And again, the Bar Creole speak in a very, very distinct, di distinct way of uh, language, which it's, it's, it's just called Creole. Actually, le Creole Pondicherry. It's called the Pondicherry Creole. So this is what, what uh, I was interested, in, and you were interested because the first time you see that the Creole word is used in Indian, uh, in a French uh, book, but talking about India. Yes, absolutely, so absolutely. Yeah, I mean, if you if you if you ask me again, what were the things when I read the Tinai, the book, and what I took, uh, what made me really uh, immediately, just like wow, this is what I'm looking for. On the one hand, it was the presence of a Creole, a distinct Creole community I mean, that would absolutely. that you were pointing out. You were you have a character who's very important in your novel called Lourdes, who is a Ba Creole woman as narrator. Uh, you intervene into your narrative and you tell the readers the difference between the O Creoles and the Bar Creoles, because of course nobody, you expect quite rightly that people don't know anything about all this. And you also put some very typical modes of speaking into the character's mouth, Lourdes' mouth, so that um, it's been observed by other critics that um, yours is the, perhaps the only book so far where Pondicherry Creole actually finds a voice. In, yep. in, in a character's mouth. Interestingly enough, though, I am also equally interested, I was also equally taken by your account of say the furniture, the bureau of the Chetiar. Now the Chetiar is not a Creole person. We saw the picture of the Chetiar. I mean, you know, the Chetiars, wherever they went, including, of course, we, we have since found there are exceptions, but in general, even in Indochina, they were very distinct because they maintained the traditional modes of dressing. They refused to wear the hat and the, and the, and the trousers, you know. So the Chetiyas remained very conservative on the face of it and very endogamous and very closed, but they look at the habitus, you know. So even if racially they did not get Creole, become Creoles, but their living space was somehow Creolized and the furniture was an example of a very good il illustration of that. So for me, I think what was interesting is that in your novel, you, there was evidence uh, of, a, of a writer from Pondicherry responding to these two different but related phenomena. The existence of a Creole community yeah. and the existence of a Creolized habitus. And of course the two are connected because look at this amazing picture that you found for us. Um, We've got the chair, which for me is the creolized habitus, and the woman who is the, woman. 
the Creole woman because she is called uh, Alice. Uh, Alice de Rosario. De Rosario, and everybody will know that de Rosario, of course, is a Portuguese, um, is a Luso Portuguese uh, derived last name. And this is the giveaway that she's a bar Creole person, because as you pointed out, Ari, the bar Creole, the lower Creole, so to speak, the little Creoles were the uh, were those who mingled and mixed with a whole bunch of anybody. European. Not French. Yeah, but not French, who were, of course, by a certain moment in Pondicherry's history, the kind of like the they were they were on top of the social, you know, they had everything had organized itself in that fashion. But before the French assumed that opposition and the hierarchy, there was a lot of volatility, the same volatility that we saw in the fragments of porcelain that the Dutch brought, the Dutch uh, town plan, etc. Similarly, if you look at Pondicherry Creole, it is full of Portuguese words, as we have also studied, okay. names as well. The surnames betray that Portuguese element, de Rosario, and um, a lot of people in, this, um, in the audience would recognize or remember that even Switching back to Bengal, um, De Rosio, our poet of young Bengal, uh, who was thoroughly Creolized in my opinion, and Creole was also, the family name was Rosario, was De Rosario. And they changed it to De Rosio because they wanted to also dissociate themselves from that idea of the Bar Creole, which was not just noticeable in Pondicherry, but all, already in Calcutta, in Cochin, and so on. And that's another story we may want to go into it if people have comments and questions. We want to get back to this idea of the Creole habitus that crystallizes around this Creole community. And we see sort of very interestingly um, uh, kind of coming together in, in these people. Uh, in this, you know. Now, I want to start moving towards the end because we, we are almost uh, at the uh, very close to our 45 minutes. I want us to move quickly further to the fact that, Ari, you have pointed out to me um, a certain interesting class of uh, material cultural kind of evidence for this creolized habitus. Mm -hmm. um, do you oh, yeah. want to tell us a little bit about this? Yeah, this this is, uh... This is the most famous furniture called Swami Furnitures, which was made uh, almost at the end of the 18th century and beginning of 19th century. Like for example, that fir the first, uh, the bed you, you showed, uh, it yes. is from 1909. This one is from 1909, which now is in possession of my very good friend, Kumar Ananda. Actually this, this piece is for, for sale. So if people are interested, they can buy it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so this is Swami Furnitures. This again, you can see, you know, the, the entire carving, the designs and everything is Indian. But of course the bed, uh, Saint Lian Baldacan, as we call, it's typical European. Yeah. You see? And this is exactly what, uh, what happened when, when, when French people came and settled down in Pondicherry. Uh, in the beginning, they, they thought that the Indian um, aesthetic or uh, uh, furniture or houses, they were not very aesthetically uh, uh, in their, for, for their taste. You know, they, they just disregarded for a long time. Then slowly they got more and more interested and they found out, no, we cannot just leave uh, side by side, but we having our own furniture and they having their, their, their different stuff. So it, they, they, they merged together and they found this new, uh, new, new style of furniture. Not only furniture, but when you see, when you go to Pondicherry, the buildings, the yeah. houses, yeah. they are all creolized. There's French element and the Indian element, which merged inside, which gave a total new. Uh, and in fact, we will go a step further because we also, and this can be seen, I think, in some of the details of this furniture, there is also a Southeast Asian element which comes in exactly. via those mercantile groups like the Chetiars who have been Chetiars. traversing the Eastern Indian Ocean space, as we know, ever since the Cholas. So there is, this is the way we uh, retool uh, notions or theories of creolization to fit the peninsular context of a place like Pondicherry and indeed of India, there are um, there are far more elements than just binaries between um, you know whether we talk about um, binaries of um, ethnicity or race or binaries of power such as masters and the enslaved. We have, for example, very prominent role played by merchants, 
And we also have, because of that prominent role, a, a geographic space, which is drawing in different kinds of cultural elements and swirling them in this enclave, in this, in this pressure cooker, you know, of an enclave to create, to produce these sorts of things. I mean, of course, furniture doesn't just stand by itself. It lives in a habitus. And this, I think, is a very example, interesting example of how a shared taste is built up, right? Exactly. See, it's interesting, you know, because this belongs to the one of the governor of Pondicherry, Monsieur Godard. Uh, you see, now it's on sale in uh, in, in Paris, uh, close to. <laughs> you see, this is this is very interesting. Kumar, the friend I'm I'm talking, is selling that bed, that Swami furniture bed, yeah. and now he's going to buy this entire salon for himself. For himself, wow. Yeah. Get me an invitation to Kumar's home. <laughs> <laughs> At least enjoy using the furniture as a guest. <laughs> because I remember when I sent this this um, this picture to you, I also sent him sent to him. He said, "Wow, I was not I was not aware about about this salon, uh, salon manger." Then he said, "So he immediately contacted people. So he's negotiating with them to get this entire salon for himself." I think, Ari, this is a very good way to start bringing the uh, matter towards our final, uh, the final few things we want to say in the talk before handing over to Liza. Um, this uh, very striking example, we would say, of creolized oh. furniture, you know, Swami furniture, creolized furniture, which is a material, cultural, real world equivalent of the kinds of fictional things you're doing in your novel. Okay, this furniture used to belong to the family of one of the governors of of Pondicherry. Now it is being bought by your friend, a Franco-Tamil person like yourself, Kumar yeah. Ananda. Yeah. I mean, this is a post-colonial twist to the tale. And I think I want to ask you a little bit to talk, tell us a little bit about who is interested anymore in Swami furniture and why. Yeah. So talking about the post-colonial twist, uh, we, we started with the Van de Tree. Uh, which the French people never managed to 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 make it happen. Ravi, Vis yeah. Ravi Viswanathan, who is a Franco Pondicherryan living in Singapore, is the guy who is behind the entire wine business in India, and he is from. Yes. <laughs> so he brought back what the French people couldn't do in in uh, in the 16th century or 17th century. Ravi Viswanathan did that. Uh, I mean, 20 years back. So this is again but the, the political the post-colonial twist that we are talking. Kumaranda, Ravi Viswanathan. So these are the people. So coming back to who are these people who are in, interested, it's a new because since Pondicherry has become a too, big tourist destination, mm -hmm. uh, there are people from the ashram, people from Oroville, and also like the common people living in Pondicherry, slowly they discover this old colonial furniture, as yours called, because it's also, it's also a big business. There's another interesting uh, young French guy uh, called Vincent Roy, who lives uh, five kilometers from Auroville, but he's not from Auroville, who is replicating this, this furniture and selling all over the world. And to end, which again, interestingly, the last merchant who is a uh, um, shop, who is selling this, uh, this furniture in, uh, in, in France, they are in Marseille and is an Armenian family. Fascinating. Well, having got, we didn't get to get to the Armenians, yeah. uh, in, um, you know, but just, I just want to show this last slide before we start wrapping up. I want to bring this new kind of memory work around, around um, a commodification of heritage, uh, which we see in the way this furniture is being used. On the one hand, we've got people who are perhaps it, it would be interesting to think about why someone like Kumar Ananda would have these massive things in his home but also there is a there is a lot of interest from hotels from hoteliers you know who want to recreate a certain ambience back in Pondicherry for tourists to come and enjoy and so there is a whole way in which in the post-colonial period we are uh, somehow remembering that creolized past, which for mm. other reasons has been marginalized and forgotten. I know that Liza wants to ask us a few questions about that, so I won't go into too much into that now, but I want to close by taking us back to your novel. Because in your novel, let's not forget that even if you're doing something similar as Kumar Ananda is doing and trying to buy back that Swami furniture, you're trying to write back, you know, by putting this Chetiar furniture in there, um, in your novel, the Chetiar Bureau has a very uh, unfortunate life. It, um, 
it does it, it's too big and it's too massive and it can't leave the house and it gets stuck inside the house and not only that the keys that the master craftsman the telugu guy used to uh, unlock the many drawers that created the cylindrical bureau has been lost and nobody can open any drawers anymore obviously as a literary critic i'm going to be quite perplexed or quite intrigued by what does it mean psychoanalytically that this thing that you spend so much time recreating lovingly is then kind of stuck inside the house its drawers can't be opened it seems a very hopeless situation um can you can you can you tell us i mean what do you what do I you know, has happened my dear collaboratrice i have no idea why i choose to uh, give that faith to that bureau uh, and i say it's so psychoanalytical uh, process that only you guys literary critic can do but well let me, you, let me let me let me now you know me closely you might find the the mystery behind that but i'm yeah, not I, <laughs> I think the mystery also the mystery also lies in this other very humble version of a bureau the buffet which we see uh, and the second photo on the side uh, there's a grand bureau there and there's the simple and humble one which in bengal we call the meat safe actually which is a very again um creolized piece of furniture in certain homes it, ho it it's the place before refrigeration you used to keep cakes or pies or these sorts of things in in the kitchens and it also occupies a very important part in your novel emotionally because that's where um, the young boy learns to read tamil because the uh, shelves of the bureau um, are lined with tamil newspapers so there's yeah. quite a lot going on in your in your novel i think about the emotional place that all these furnitures that come out of the creolized material culture of pondicherry is not just creolized there's a hope that it might be creolizing you know there's a hope that this um it is not a relegate not something relegated or reified in the past the stuck bureau perhaps is a is that lament you know but somehow in inscribing it in your novel there's a hope that it might be released that which is stuck may somehow get unstuck you know and Perfect. maybe the work we are doing on the tinai creole which i know liza wants to talk to us about is a way releasing the 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 stuck and reified creole object into a more dynamic creolizing uh present and future um anything more to add before we hand over to no, but that's exactly what edward glisson said no la memoire du futur yeah the memory of the future that's what glisson did say um about about creolization uh, as a process so um i think we want to leave it at that um i want to hand over to our host and our respondent um and uh, over to you guys now thank you so much ananya and ari that was fascinating and i would now like to invite professor liza oliver to have a conversation with our speakers and i also wanted to remind our audiences that if you want to put in your questions please do it now and i'll take them in order uh, so thank I'll, you i'll stop screen sharing if i may liza are you okay with that so that we yeah, can just fine. hi there so hi. thank you so much ariana nania for that really uh, really interesting um collaborative discussion about creolizing cultures in pondicherry i have a few questions that i wanted to ask you Uh, but I first have to go back to that desk again because it's so it's so fascinating. Um, when reading your passages that Ananya put up on the screen, I was struck by uh, I was struck by a few things. And the first is that uh, Reasoner, who was I'm not he's German, but I know he was working in French. So I'm not exactly sure. Is it Reasoner or Reasonay? Um, he was he was um, you know it's interesting because on one hand you have a Telugu carpenter who is emulating this kind of desk that was made by Reasoner. and then on the other hand he himself was somebody who was emulating often chinese inspired lacquerware in some of his pieces um that was coming from boats that first stopped in pondicherry and that then shipped these things into france such that they were even called uh, by the mid 18th century coromandels because there was so much sort of confusion about their geographical point of origin mm -hmm. and so in this story you have you have not just a kind of unidirectional emulation of the telugu carpenter wanting to outdo and surpass 
uh, Reisner's piece, but you also have a kind of emulation that follows the trade routes that makes Pondicherry such a creolizing place to begin with. And, you know, oftentimes art historians throw, throw around words like style and influence, and I think that this example really shows the way that these concepts can be historicized and that they can, you know, that they are really grounded in very real concrete um, situations and dynamics between people, such that the desk actually becomes its own kind of contact zone for people who never actually met in person, but who nonetheless uh, meet through, through this kind of stylistic interchange and competition that they have among them. Um, and so that sort of leads me to, to my first question for you generally about material culture and the work you're doing. As an art historian, that's sort of the foundation of what I focus on, but you both add, a, a, add have an additional layer that you add to it, um, approaching it through literature, through a kind of logocentric approach. So you're taking material things and then again, filtering it through something that is about language ultimately. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering just how it is that you were brought to material culture as such an integral way of understanding creolizing cultures through literature because uh, for you Anania it seems it may be a sort of extension of the performance the performativity yeah. that is an aspect of your research yeah. for you Ari it seems that memory is playing uh, playing an integral role in your incorporation of material culture so I was wondering if you could both begin by just talking a little bit more about that. Ari why don't you start and then I'll Oh yeah, you know I'm you, you. You are the theorist, so you theorize what I say. <laughs> so me, me not going, me not good in, the, in theorization. Uh, no, for me it's mo mostly about memories, as I said. It, it's not only memories; it's also um, change the narrative, uh, uh, change the focus on narration when we talk about literature about Pondicherry. Uh, you know, when 350 years people, the French people never wrote about Pondicherry in that way, because they were Pondicherry in, in, in the, in the uh, as I said, the Roman colonial, the colonial novels, it's only about the white town, uh, Europeans living in the white town. Okay, sometimes they mingle with uh, people in the black town, but there's nothing in between, there's nothing, you know? And even the, the detail or uh, any kind of narration, they, they don't go detail into the black town. They are talking about mostly about the white town. So I wanted to change the course of narration and say there is other things happening in, in the black town, which is more interesting. There's not only Ananda Ranga Pillai, there are other people who are more far more interesting than Ananda Ranga Pillai, even, even though that Ananda Ranga Pillai can be interested for, for people. So that's why my 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 idea of introducing the Chetias and the Creole is, is made purposely in order to decolonize the literature, the Pondicherry literature. So that is my personal and sole, uh, sole aim. And to be honest, I didn't know there was a material culture in Pondicherry before I started to write that piece about the, the, the furniture. And only why, as I said, it took me three months to write that, that paragraph. That only when I did my research, I understood the different layers of material culture existing in Pondicherry. So that opened my eye. And then, then, I, when I, sorry. then when I met Ananya. So she told me many times that's, that's how I got introduced to material culture. No, no, I think that's not entirely accurate because all along you were also, when we met, of course you had written the Tinaya and that was written, but you were now also looking a lot at the textiles and everything. And you know, yeah, that yeah, you got yeah, to know. Yeah. You told no, no, but I, what I said, what I said, Ananya, I was not aware of material culture as an academic discipline. In that sense, in that perhaps, sense. yeah. But also, I mean, I am I am also in a way, uh, well, as you know, Liza, um, you've obviously, perhaps from this position of an art historian wondered, what on earth are all these literary critics doing now with things? You know, there has been this material turn, as we know, in, in, in humanities, uh, whether the historians who are looking at the flow and the movement of goods and, obviously then we as uh, readers and critics, our attention gets drawn, you know, as Supriya Chaudhary herself said, what are all these things doing in the living rooms of the 19th century novels? And then we see, oh wow, they're also there in the 19th century Bengali novel or, you know, so uh, there is obviously a very rich uh, vein uh, of, of, of things there, literally stuff to analyze and to give, give uh, depth 
and new um, shed new light on the way we want to understand what we what is it that we are studying. Um, in this case, creolization is what I'm looking at. And I did find material culture to be a very, very fascinating um, area where a lot of abstract, um, uh, a lot of abstract ideas can really, um, you know, congeal and make us see things very clearly. Because um, in my work on dance, I already, as you pointed, uh, you referred, I started moving into performance, into kind of embodiment. So the written word already became kind of released from the confines of the text and started Re in kind of reinfusing with the energy of the body, you know, um, and that's what, in a way, also reminded me. That's the energy of of Creole languages, for example. They are very defiantly oral and embodied, so you've got to be attentive to that that part, that dimension. But when I was studying, for example, the Mando of Goa, I couldn't study that Creolized dance and music form, as I came to understand it, without thinking about all the material cultural stuff that accrues around it, the costumes that people are wearing, then the costumes that houses are went to to talk to people, the things in their homes, the, the kind of furniture, which is very similar to some of the Swami furniture. That, so, you know, all this made me realize that Creolization can't exist only on the level of words and, and language. It ha it's a habitus. And so, but, I have to be very careful. I'm not an art historian, certainly not. I can't, um, I need the expertise of the art historian to understand why a writer like Ari is, is finding it an important thing to spend three months on writing about a piece of furniture, which in a way, it's not his job to analyze, it's my job to analyze. He's just doing the writing and you know he can answer my questions. But to understand that, I have to go to the new studies, the new material, materialist turn, look at the work of the art historian, look at Indian, uh, Indian Ocean histories, uh, look at, um, understand who a Chetiar is to kind of work out why is that figuring in this way. So, but I would also say it's memory because every time I went to a house in Goa, every time I see, I speak to someone like Ari, I started realizing that I, my, my life in Calcutta where I grew up was very, was linked. We also shared in this creolized habitus. So suddenly there's a kind of feeling that, oh my God, I know those chairs. <laughs> I know that meat safe. I know, we may call it different things, but I know. So I'm somehow part of the same story I'm trying to tell. So it's very, you know, that in material culture has a way, we sit in those chairs, literally, you know? So then as a critic, I want to think about how the description of somebody sitting in that chair or using such a bureau interpolates me as a critic into that. How do I bring my subjectivity back to it? And before we know it, we're writing about Creole Indias, not just about Creole Pondicherry or you know Goa or Bengal. We are seeing, wow, these things circulate and linked up. So that's why I think material culture is quite important in that way. But it's always gonna be a secondary order. You know, It's always gonna then be put back into the text to see what is it doing there. Right, great, thank you. So I also wanted to ask you about the collaboration that the two of you have, uh, Le Tinai Creole, uh, which is something that I've watched a few times on your Facebook live feed, um, and I've been thoroughly enjoying it. Um, the work that you're doing, and we've already talked a little bit about this, is of political importance at this moment in time. I mean, it's about pushing back against essentializing, homogenizing narratives of identity um, that have become louder and louder across many parts of the globe in recent decades. And at the same time, your project is one that is historical. Um, and I'm sure you're completely aware, you are completely aware of the complexities, the violence, the power differentials that went hand in hand with the, the historical periods that you, you discuss and you consider. And so my question to you is how it is, it, what role do power asymmetries and violence play in your theorization of creolization? Um, how do you do justice to the heterogeneity and to the kind of multiculturalism of the periods you're considering while also not falling into the trap of idealizing those periods for the sake of responding to this current political moment? Mm -hmm. Fantastic. And that's really an important question that allows us to clarify position. Again, Ari, I don't know if you want to talk to any of no, it. I can, I can start and then you, you, can, you can end. Yeah. Because uh, as um, everybody knows, Latina is mine, the Creole is yours. So that's, <laughs> what, that's what I become, Latina Creole. You see, uh, I, uh, the Tine as physical space uh, existed as a book, it existed. I invited you to come and sit on my Tine, but you came not just empty-ended, 
but you came with something which is the, uh, the theory of uh, creolization. But since also we also share uh, same values about living in a harmonious society and where and uh, fighting for this kind of uh, cultural hegemony and uh, also trying to impose one way of thinking or one way of dressing, one way of eating, one way of behaving and one way of loving. So we want to break all these things, uh, all these ideas. And uh, as we always say, the Tine Creole is a place, is, is a space of resistance. Mm -hmm. As simple as that. We are here to resist. Madame, à toi. Okay, so to just elaborate on that a little bit more um, and to take the idea of resistance back straight to your question, uh, Liza, um, how do you resist out of an unequal, out of, out, of, out of a historical moment, which was fundamentally one of um, the asymmetrical power relations, you know, because how, I mean, when you go, so even classic theories of creolization, you know, when we just look at the so-called master-slave dialectic in a plantation society, would have room for thinking about creolization itself as an act of resistance because it comes out of the ability to um, absorb the external influence and ride back with the body and say, we are doing our own thing with this and this is how we remake the materials into, and we rewrite the script. You know, if you want to use a, a logocentric metaphor again, but you know, or, or we re re-perform the dance or whatever, you know, so this is, um, the, my, my, my research on embodied culture really taught me these valuable lessons as to how really in the act of doing itself, you know, you resisted because you did something, you know. And um, even Ashil uh, Bembe in Necropolitics has that line, which is very powerful. He says that the gesture of self-styling, you know, the, the, if, even in the, even when everything, every a, every ounce of sovereignty was taken away from the enslaved, they still had the gesture. So, you know, in that moment, I find, I always found the most powerful spark of resistance. When we then come to thinking about unfolding this very, um, very uh, uh, simplified, shall we say, schema of, 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 of a master slave dialectic, somehow giving birth to resistance, which is realized in the act of being performed or uttered and so on. But you know, that's why it's important to see how does this kind of a, a theory uh, stand up when you take it to a space like Monticherry where the number of actors multiply, the power dynamics are different, the asymmetries are different. This is not a settler, you know, a plantation society. Um, and um, there are lots of intermediaries with differential positions on the power, you know, brokering such as the Chetiars. So here, I think the entire notion of resistance um, of, um, who is powerful, who is resisting, who is disempowered becomes quite complex. I think becomes infinitely more complicated and gives us therefore the analyst more grist to the mill, you know, how, where is the resistance and what is being resisted? I think it's important to also be quite, um, look quite squarely in the eye, the role of the caste system in, in intervening within the creolizing process. So, you know, any, any comment on creolization in the Indic, peninsula Indic space has to take into account the role of caste. That's why I thought it was important. We didn't have time to go into Ari's own subjectivity here, but I do think it's important that if we go back to the author, Ari Gautier, he is not a Bach Creole, he is not a Chetiar, but you are a Franco-Tamil, you know, a uh, person who traces your, your lineage back or your subjectivity back to the moment of so-called renouncing, you know, which was Absolutely. attached to either a very high caste group, the Velarajas, or a very, very low caste group, the abjected so-called Pariyas. So when you see the spectrum, you immediately see, wow, you've got a creolizing historical dynamic in Pondicherry set into motion by the act of renouncing, you know, but the people participating typically are either very high caste or extremely low caste. You know, already you're, you know, the matter is very complex. Then you've got somebody therefore like Ari who is 
identifying and or, or making prominent that descent from the Paria Franco Tamil Renaissance line, who is taking the whole matter into his control and creating a space where the Chetiar and his furniture are being, you know, manipulated by the author. This is power and the French language itself. So, you know, I think this itself is an act of, this is where literature as an act of resistance, the way you write and what you write about as an act of resistance, this is how the literary critic, I think, in hand, you know, in collaboration with the author can shed light on some of these complicated uh, manifestations of creolization uh, in the Indic space, which really are a bit more granular. We have to look at the granularity. We have to look at the scale. We have to go a bit lower and see what is going on to be able to recreate that map of resistance, you know, where collaboration has also to be acknowledged, different kinds of collaborations, negotiations, capitulations. And again, that's how the literature, the work of literature can make us aware, you know, that there are all sorts of positions that people had to take inadvertently or knowingly. And then the author is the inheritor of all that, which is why the bureau is stuck perhaps, you know? <laughs> so yeah, so I hope that answered the question a little bit. We've got to be careful in taking the models of creolization over to the peninsula space. That's the bottom line really, but it doesn't mean we can't use it and refine it. Thank you. Um, Thank you, Ananya and Ari and Liza. I think we should start taking the questions now. Uh, we already have four of them, so I'll take them in order. The first one is from uh, Rin Chukwoka. Uh, the use of the term Creole seems to mean different things for different people. In Sierra Leone, the Creole are regarded as all the non-Indigenous people who were reintroduced to Freetown at uh, after the abolition of slavery in the Americas. So by your definition to be Creole, you have to have mixed biologically and culturally with the French. Um, okay, Ari, shall I take this? Or? No, please, please, please. Okay. Uh, but I'll refer to what you said about the O Creoles and Bar Creoles mm -hmm. too. Uh, I think this is Namdi. Um, uh, you know, uh, Namdi, it's uh, really important that you mentioned Sierra Leone because it's a very uh, interesting parallel to a place like Pondicherry because again, it's uh, Sierra Leone itself, especially Freetown, it's a peninsula, it's an, it's an enclave, you know, on the west coast of Africa. Um, if we go back to what um, Liza was saying about how even the the cabinets that the Telugu cabinet maker was emulating were the product of certain flows of goods and uh, culture before <laughs> the French came you know, to, to India. The whole process by which Sierra Leone was established is something similar because we already, we, we, we cannot, it's just thinking of a one-way flow of people from Africa and Europe to the Americas, and then creolization happens, just doesn't work. They then uh, start spiraling, and then a place like Sierra Leone emerges, you know, where people are resettled, as you say. Um, now, they were Creole because they were already mixed, and they mixed further with the local people who are already there, with other Europeans. I mean, th we really want to say that to be Creole, um, is not necessarily you have to be mixed with one kind of person only or two, like A and B mixed to become Creole. We are more interested in a multiplicity of influences. On the biological level, yes, there is a, there is a way to think about biological, biologically created Creole communities who remember that fact, whether in their surnames or whether in their myths of, myths of genesis and, 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 uh, you know, and community formation. And in Pondicherry's case, we have two such groups, the high Creoles, the O Creoles, and the bar Creoles or the low Creoles. And in that case, these people remember themselves as the high Creoles, so-called, are the ones who were only mixed with the French and the low Creoles are the ones who were mixed with everything else. I, I say so-called because you know, <laughs> as all of us know, what human beings do in intimacy is really far beyond the policing of uh, these definitions. These are just for social control, these definitions. But within those definitions, yes, Creole means biological mixing. Creolized means different ways in which different groups of people attach themselves to that culture produced through biological mixing. And that becomes 
like spread out in a variety of ways through habitus or how we live. So I hope that that makes some sense, but certainly Sierra Leone is a very exa important example and a parallel example to a place like Pondicherry. It's a continental space of creolization, not an insular space. So, so thanks for that. Anything to add, Ari? No. Okay, all right. <laughs> Please, you, you know you can always shut me up. Yeah, 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 of course. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from Emma Alexander. Uh, can you speak to the connection with post-colonial diasporas and how much they ignore or reconnect with creolized cultures? I see so many attempts to reify or ignore mixture of cultures while in the process of actually creolizing again in diaspora. That's a great question again, Emma. Ari, I think maybe you can talk to some examples uh, of this, which we've noticed perhaps ourselves in our work. Well, no, I mean, if you were to talk about the, for example, the, the franco pondicherry community as yeah. a diasporic uh, community living, living uh, in France or other part of the world, why other part of the world, as, you, as we know that the Pondicherian were sent all over the French empire. Uh, from Indochina to Africa to Caribbean uh, to uh, Nouvelle Caledonia. So this diasporic community, when they move, they also get creolized where they go. You see, yes. be it in a New Caledonia, like my father uh, in Madagascar, for example. So, you know, it, it, it's again, creolizing the, re-creolizing the creolization already. So they, it's keep on having a snowball effect wherever they go. They create, they keep on creating something new out of what they carry as the cultural bagage uh, already from Pondicherry. And uh, this is very fascinating because that's exactly what I'm doing in my next novel, which is called Pondicherry in Saga Creole. Why I call it in Saga Creole? Because of exactly what I'm talking. Uh, and even J Jessica Namakal has, has said, the, how the, uh, the, the marriage, the, the way the subjects are moving from one place to another and keep on coming back with a totally different creolization process. And uh, the family I'm talking is a family of Franco Pondicherian who have moved the entire French empire from Africa to New, uh, what they call, um, um, the, the Antilles to Indochina and the family itself get creolized. So this is very, something in common, but already in my family, that's what how, how we live. But I think Emma is quite right also in pointing out that sometimes, or quite often there is a backlash and people don't want to, while they are in the processes, they don't want to acknowledge the processes. You know what I mean? Um, this is quite common. This is absolute. So Emma, you're quite right when you say that the uh, post-colonial diasporas, however creolized they may be themselves or however uh, re-creolizing processes they may be caught up in, they may feel obliged to detach them or remove themselves from those processes and declare themselves to be quote unquote pure. For instance, um, uh, this is why they might seek to reconnect back to uh, uh, to each other, uh, for example, uh, Ari, we, we, we know that there is a lot of people in Guadeloupe and Martinique who are of Franco, uh, who are of uh, Tamil origin, which is perhaps left a little vestige in their surnames, but they have in the course of, uh, as, as a theorist of creolization, one can totally see they're totally creolized. They're, but they would resist that because they feel they've lost their identity in the creolizing mix and to know who they are, they have to almost step out of that mix and reconnect with some forces that can help them understand what the Indian part of themselves is. Very unfortunately, politically, this often takes them straight into the arms of various majoritarian forces who take advantage of that very human desire to know who am I and feed it with all kinds of other uh, kind of, uh, uh, you know, very, very streamlined and very simplified tales of belonging and identity. And this is exactly why on Thin I Creole, we want to open up those confusions and complications again and show to people that when you connect with each other, you're actually connecting as creolized peoples, peoples who have creolized in different ways. And this, it's okay. There is a valorization of that. It's not, nothing to be embarrassed about or ashamed about. So we do provide a way, I think, in which a lot of people are 
feeling comfortable with that word and claiming that word and what it stands for uh, without feeling. Um, in fact, Ari, didn't you tell me that some people that you know yourselves who are of Pondicherry Creole families are now saying we are Creole. I mean, whereas previously they would not have said that. I mean, yeah, you, you know, it's, it's, it's quite interesting also because, you know, uh, as I said, the, the, this Franco Pondicherry community has been moving around the French Empire. Like, for example, a place like Guadeloupe, where the clear distinction before, between the Afro descendants and the indentured labor would don't want to be considered as Creole. You see, they don't want to enter the Creole world at all. So even there is a clear distinction. Sorry? Even though they're completely in it in terms yeah, of- Yeah, they're completely in it. They, but they, they, they want to, you know, they, they want to isolate themselves from the Creole thing. But it's, that pattern, it's not all over the plantation uh, history because in Reunion is something different, in Mauritius is different. Uh, but again, like for example, like in Guadeloupe, I've seen, so there's the Afro descendants and then the indentured labor uh, descendants who don't want to be seen as Creole. And then you have this Pondicherry, Franco Pondicherry who are living in Guadeloupe. They don't want to get assimilated to the indentured labor either, even though they are Pondicherry, they're Tamilians. You see, then again, that's why nobody wants to enter that Creole world, even though they are living inside. And so, you know, it. there's a, yeah. different layers of non-accepting or not want to be part of that, but again, be part of that. Yeah, I mean, so in short, Emma, again, this is the typical uh, classic situation, whereas uh, uh, analysts of culture and history, we observe certain things, but people in that space may not want to identify with those exactly. terms. And that's fine. That's their prerogative. And we must be delicate with feelings of people. We can't just say, well, you know, but at the same time, I think we do have a duty to point out that this is, it's okay, you know, it's, 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 a, it's, if, if they, if when they see an author writing a novel about Creole Pondicherry in all its glory, connected to the diaspora, there's a whole element of the narrative in Ari's story in the Thinai about how the Guadeloupe connection happens historically. So what I mean is that when they read this, there is a way of feeling valorized. They're like, oh, my story is in there and it's okay, you know? So perhaps literature has a role to play in, 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 in reminding people there are, there's more than one way of, of configuring identity and belonging, right? So. I, we can, of course, Emma, you and I, we can, all of us can continue talking about this back behind, back channel, <laughs> but it's a great question. Thanks. Thank you. I think uh, we are running out of time. So I'll take the last question, which is by Milin. Um, he says, what are your thoughts on material culture that is not manifested in the sensible or palpable, but is reflected in the intelligible? I must say I'm a little confused by that question. I'm not quite yeah, sure. Are you are you confused too, Ari? Maybe yeah, Milen, yeah, can, maybe Milen, could you could you perhaps elaborate? What do you mean by the intelligible? For me, to be honest, material culture is that which is sensible and palpable. Maybe this is a very old-fashioned definition of material culture, but that is my definition of material culture, and it coexists on a spectrum with embodied culture, which can also be, you know. I mean, it's material in as much as it emanates from the body. It, does Milan mean that when he talks about intelligible? I'm not sure. It would be great to get a clarification. But maybe while if Milan this clarifying for us, I'll if I may, Priyanka, I'm just going to go quickly to Esha's question. Yes. Do you want me to read it out? Yes, please. Yes. So uh, Esha says, Ananya and Ari, thank you so much for that amazing talk. I was wondering if you could elaborate a bit more on the fractal geometry of the vine on trellis and how it might come to function as a contact zone within a contact zone to reactivate a memory of the future in Glisson's terms. How might such a reactivation impact the contrapuntal interplay of the transoceanic and literal vectors to pave the path for a creolizing history of water? Ari, I'll give you. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you know me and Aisha, we are not friends when it comes to questions. <laughs> Ari is just teasing Esha. Esha always asks such <laughs> wonderful questions that we then need to have fractally open out another whole talk. So I'm just going to answer very, very briefly. You, you, you do it, please. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think we can go back to all the things we said. Um, the Yes, the vine on trellis is fractal in the sense that it's a self. What is fractal? It's a, it's a pattern that repeats a version of itself infinitely, you know. So it is fractal and it is in that sense, creolization 
theorists of creolization are in pretty much agreement that creolization is also there's a fractal element to it when you see how creolized culture reproduces itself. So of course, phenomenologically, when you see the vine on the trellis, it's a very clever um, uh, observation, uh, Isha. Indeed, there is that connection through the fractal way of um, unfolding. You know, um, memory of the future. I'll we could interpret that in hundreds of ways, but the very fact that today we have vine vines producing wine <laughs> in Pondicherry. I mean, in, in India, I think this is a memory of the future. The Creole, um, I mean, the, the colonial, um, the colonial vine on trellis disappeared, but its memory is reactivated in attempts today to uh, um, uh, re create the creolized habitus in different ways. And I find a very powerful example of that if we depart from the vine, but go to something parallel, the furniture, you know that Kumar Ananda, your friend, Ari, uh, who is not a, ch a chatiar, if I, if I'm, he's not, he's not, a he's not from the governor's family. Uh, somebody is, 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 is using a, that, or that furniture is getting replicated in different ways and reused in different ways, reactivated in different ways. This is the memory of the future that was already held in almost the DNA of that vine on the trellis, which was fractal. Um, I think we'll reserve the transoceanic and littoral vectors for another day. Suffice it to say that transoceanic for us denotes all the cultural elements that are coming from across the Indian and Atlantic Ocean worlds, the bureau itself as an idea. And littoral is the ways in which um, the, this culture creolizing and creolized moves up and down the coastlines say uh, between Pondicherry and Chandanagar or between Pondicherry and Karekal, just to stick to the French enclaves. But when we have the Portuguese coming in, De Rosario, the surname moving from Cochin to uh, Goa to up to Calcutta to Pondicherry, that's the vector, that's the littoral vector, you know, the coastal vector. So we'll, um, we'll kind of keep it at that, but uh, definitely uh, lots to say about all that, that would take another hour at least. No, but you know, just, just, to, um, just to finish that, uh, sorry Priyanka, just to finish that exactly like what we talk about the wine, and that's what I took the example of Ravi Vishwanathan, and that very few people know who is that. So he again re took that idea of, I'm sure he knows about uh, Vain Utri, which was, uh, which was started in Pondicherry and uh, Surat and different places. One of the reasons that he's also from Pampe Pancheri is bringing back that wine culture back in back to India. So that is very symbolic, which is very interesting to to note. I will. I know we are running out of time, but there's one. I will just give a one line answer to Jayanti Mehrotra, who has asked: Is there a point where one can depart from the label, which is an imposed one? Jayanti, I I, I empathize with you there. Perhaps you're talking about Creole as a label. Uh, we are always in labels. If we want to look for some indigenous word, which exists in Indian languages, we are using. We are thinking a lot about the word Parangi, for example, these days, which is a Tamil and Malayalam version of Firangi, which is the way in which these people like Alice Rosario would have been called, you know, in Cochin at least, they would be called the Parankis. But that is also a label. Somebody is imposing a labels are always there associated with the act of imposition, whether we are imposing it or somebody else is imposing it. For us, it's a heuristic. It's a device to understand and explicate cultural uh, phenomena. It's not about putting people in boxes and leaving them there <laughs> imprisoned. So uh, with, with the key lost. <laughs> <laughs> So hopefully that helps. Priyanka, <laughs> over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Ananya, Ari, and Liza for that wonderful session today. And uh, thanks to our audiences for joining us tonight. Our next talk is next week, which is uh, the 26th of July, same time, 5.30 p.m. We have Trisha Singh from McGill University in Canada, uh, who's going to speak on arguing for a feminine space, People's Theatre in Calcutta between 1940 and 1960. And the session would be chaired by Professor Shubho Basu from McGill University. So thank you again for that brilliant session and uh, stay safe, take care and good night. Thank you.